MEI Art Gallery showcases the most exciting contemporary and modern art from the Middle East. Our current exhibit, Perceptible Rhythms, Alternative Temporalities, features 12 artists who explore the impact of conflict, urbanization, and the climate crisis on their environments. Open Monday through Friday from 10 to 5 p.m., the MEI Art Gallery is open to the public. Or book your visit today at mei.edu slash arts and culture center. Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Hello, and welcome to Middle East Focus, a weekly podcast on regional affairs and U.S. policy, produced by the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. I'm Alistair Taylor, MEI's Editor-in-Chief. On today's program, we'll be talking about the U.S.-China tech cold war and what it means for the Middle East. At the nexus of great power competition and rapid technological advances in areas like semiconductors and artificial intelligence, the rivalry between Washington and Beijing is fueling a longer-term process of economic and technological decoupling. Navigating this growing divide will be a key challenge for regional actors across the Middle East and North Africa going forward. You can subscribe to Middle East Focus on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other podcast providers. Joining us to discuss these issues is Mohamed Suleiman. Mohamed is the director of MEI's Strategic Technologies and Cybersecurity Program and a manager at McClarty Associates MENA Practice. His work focuses on the intersection of technology, geopolitics, and business in emerging markets. Mohamed, welcome to the program, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Alistair. Greetings from Saudi Arabia. Mohamed, let's, let's dive right in. U.S.-China relations have become increasingly fraught in recent years, and that's having a major impact on the tech sector, giving rise to what many experts are calling a tech cold war. Late last year, the Biden administration imposed restrictions preventing U.S. companies from exporting cutting-edge semiconductors to China, along with the software and equipment needed to produce them. U.S. allies Japan and the Netherlands have since followed suit. Where do you see these trend lines heading? And do you think we're ultimately likely to see a complete severing of ties in the tech and the cyber spheres? This is an excellent uh, question. Let me go back to a statement that was made by U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina uh, Raimondo uh, when she was in Delhi. She met with Prime Minister Modi, and she said something that was very important. She said there would be two ecosystems of technology, one consisting with our democratic values and one not. The U.S. and India need to lead the world together in this technology ecosystem. So what does she mean here? She means that we're going to head towards two policy trajectories. The first one, severe decoupling from China, a massive restriction trying to cut ties completely. And the second policy option is targeted decoupling, where the United States is going to urbanize technology choke points in industries such as aviation, AI, cloud, biotechnology to slow down China's progress. And I'm much more inclined towards the second policy trajectory is going to be targeted slash managed tech decoupling with, with China. And this is not only driven by the United States itself, it's driven by companies, other regional governments, and actually China itself. And we're going to see this tech decoupling manifesting from the U.S. side as export control on U.S. technologies that are critical to Chinese innovation technology. Visa restrictions on Chinese citizens, limits on Chinese investment in the United States, but also some sort of limits on U.S. investment in, in Chinese technology. And finally, you're going to might see outright ban of Chinese technologies. And the current discussion about TikTok fits within that framework. So this is how I see the trajectory of tech decoupling between the United States and China. U.S. companies have begun to diversify their manufacturing and supply chains away from China, looking to ramp up production in countries that are geopolitically aligned with the West, a process known as friendshoring. Many companies, including most recently Apple, are looking to the Indian market in particular as a potential alternative to China when it comes to both manufacturing and consumer sales. How do you see geopolitics reshaping tech manufacturing and supply chains? And which countries are likely to come out winners or let me start with defining friendshoring. Friendshoring is the act of manufacturing and sourcing products from nations that are geopolitically aligned with your interest 
and goals. And they're also close to your supply chain. And the main goal of Frenchuring is how to access international markets and supply chain, why you are reducing certain Jabulka risk. And Frenchuring came to life because of the current tensions in the US-China relations, but also the realization there is some sort of over concentration of manufacturing capabilities in China. So when we had COVID-19 and then China pursuing zero COVID policy, there was massive disruption to global supply chain. So companies and countries, including the United States, have been thinking about a way to reduce the risk of disruption to supply chain. So French shoring came to life. And I would say that there are a couple of countries that I keep an eye on as possible winners of this trend. I would say India is, is a major player here. And I'm again using Treasury Secretary Yellen when she was also in Delhi in 2023. And she was making clear that the United States wants to make the U.S.-India tech ties part of uh, French shoring, that they're looking to India as an important part of United States strategy of French shoring, where supply chain that's very critical to the United States is going to move somehow to, to India. And the prime example that she used is, of course, Apple and Google, because the two tech companies have grown their own footprint inside uh, India in the last few years post-COVID and also the geopolitical tensions with uh, with China. I still think that India has a long way to go when it comes to reforms and human capital to fully optimize the opportunities stemming from this French shoring trend. However, in my viewpoint, it's a very uh, big player uh, in the French shoring trend. The second country I think about is Mexico. And part of Mexico is it's geographically close to the United States. It's part of the North Africa trade agreement with Canada as well. So there's a legal framework that makes U.S. producers, manufacturers looking to India as a prime location for production. And we have seen how companies like Tesla is building manufacturing capabilities in northern Mexico. I would say the third country that I also think about is Vietnam in terms of cost of production, in terms of supply chain, in terms of location. I think Vietnam is also a country that's going to win from this trend. This being said, I'm not saying that everyone else is going to lose because I think that the biggest challenge that exists today, that there's an over concentration of manufacturing capabilities and capacity inside China that creates an opportunity for everyone to capitalize on to try to play a role in this French shoring phenomena slash relocation of supply chain away from, from China. Turning to the Middle East more specifically, the region's tech infrastructure and digital environment have been shaped by its long ties with the West, but China is now offering an increasingly appealing alternative through companies and initiatives like Huawei and the Digital Silk Road. How are regional actors navigating the growing divide between Washington and Beijing? And what do you see as the main challenges and opportunities for them? Let me stress on a point that you raised, Alistair. The Middle East, specifically the Gulf states, have been going through economic and tech transformation in the last few years. And this tech transformation has been very reliant on a global system of free flow of technologies. Technologies that are coming from the United States, but also coming from other Asian powers like Korea, Japan, but also China, as you have mentioned. So when the Gulf states were looking ahead towards major milestones on the global scale, on the global level, like the World Cup in Qatar or Expo in Dubai or the G20 in Saudi Arabia, they were looking into deployment of 5G as a very important element of their own digital transformation strategy. So they looked into Huawei as an alternative, purely on economic metrics, meaning Huawei was 30, 40, 50% cheaper than the Western alternatives, Nokia and Ericsson. So they made the deals. They were earlier to deploy 5G networks in their own major cities in the UAE and Saudi Arabia and Qatar. That was a major success. But then somehow down the road, we had the United States and China headed toward collision course, specifically under the Trump administration, when they looked into technology as a sphere of a competition. And then we had the United States going after Huawei and China when it comes to 5G. So we started with what we call the Clean Network Initiative, 
uh, United States Prussian allies to exclude Huawei from their own network. And then after the allies, they went to partners like Brazil, like Gulf states, like countries in Asia, trying to tell them to stay away from Huawei. So this is where we started to see competition having a spillover effect on digital transformation, that you have to put poker risk in your own international relations in consideration when you are pursuing technological transformation objectives. And the way forward is going to be challenging, right? Because if in the last 10 years, digital transformation was much more reliant on an open system of free flow of technologies, this is not really the way forward. You're going to have much more restrictive technological environment. Uh, you're going to have the Gulf states have to pick and choose and put geopolitical interest at the heart of these choices. Do you think Middle Eastern states will eventually have to make a choice between the U.S. and China when it comes to questions like who will build key tech infrastructure? Or will they be able to forge their own path, as we've seen them do increasingly of late on the, the kind of political and economic fronts? The Gulf of states are different than other regions. They have their resources. They have the political will. They have been investing heavily in building their own domestic capabilities. So you see, for example, on the question of 5G, which I believe this is a very important issue here, they built an Open RAN initiative. Open RAN is Open Radio Access Network, uh, trying to diversify the vendors who service the 5G network. It's a consortium of companies in the Gulf, from Zane to Itzalat, to SDC, to Omentel. So it's all the Gulf countries working together to try to forge their own way in the 5G uh, space. And part of it that they have the resources because Open RAN is a very expensive, forward-looking initiative and project. So they are trying to forge their own way. You also see Saudi Arabia having its own industrial policy that was just rolled out back in October they're looking to 12 subsectors that they want to focus on. They bought electrical vehicle company called Lucid in the United States. They're looking into producing uh, and localize uh, the production of electrical vehicles into the kingdom. So they are trying to build their own capabilities in a way that they are much more self-reliant rather than just have to choose between two different camps. And again, this is also a factor of the political will, but also the resources that are put behind these sorts of initiatives. I think that last point is is really crucial because it's it's really hard to speak about the Middle East and North Africa as one entity when it comes to tech, given the kind of huge diversity and the disparities between regions or subregions rather on on things like economic indicators from from kind of Yemen to Qatar. You know, it's it's just a huge uh, divide there. How does that affect the the kind of broader MENA tech landscape, and and how would you divide the region up in terms of kind of levels of tech readiness? This is an excellent question, Alistair. In my viewpoint, the region is three subregions. You have the Gulf states, I would say the GCC countries. You have the North African republics, and then you have the Levant. I would say the GCC is, in my viewpoint, comes as number one when it comes to digital capabilities and having the ability to attract global companies in technologies from China to Japan to Korea to the United States and the West. And part of it is that they have the financial resources and the political well, and it's part of their own national economic strategies to diversify their economies post oil for the longer term. And then you have the North African region who comes second. Uh, you have a country like Egypt that has been, has the luxury of demographics, was is always seen as a lucrative market because of the demographic element. It's also a country with almost more than $400 billion GDP, also second economy in Africa. It's also using its own location as an advantage, has a base for STEM graduates. So they have a digital ecosystem that exists that you can see when it comes to startups, right? You see startups coming out of Cairo. You see how VC venture capital firms are looking to Cairo as a hub. This being said, the country is going through economic problems that somehow prevent the government from able to have a national effort for district transformation. So it's, there's definitely a clear discrepancy that you see in Egypt. I would say the same applies to other countries that are going through some sort of political instability to some extent are a bit after Egypt and North Africa, of course, Tunisia and Algeria. But there's another success story I see, which is Morocco. 
the way Morocco built its own car manufacturing capabilities. They're doing good in terms of industrial policy. They're also attractive to cup similar to Egypt. I would say this is North Africa is a mixed bag between challenges and opportunities. And then the third sub-region, I would say, is the Levant, when you have Iraq, Syria, Lebanon going through a tough political environment and security environment that makes the region suffers on the digital transformation front. Mohamed, given everything that you've said, taking a, a bit of a step back, what can states in the region do to prepare so that they can maximize the benefits of digital transformation while minimizing the, the geopolitical risks of, of the U.S.-China tech war? Let me start by saying that every crisis is an opportunity. And, and again, the core of the U.S.-China tech competition is there is a realization that there is over-centralization of manufacturing capabilities in China. China is the factory of the world. And right now, if I'm advising policymakers, I would say prepare your legal frameworks, do reforms, build human capital, so your country is able to optimize any sort of opportunities that would stem from, from the fact that companies want to diversify away from China. There's a clear opportunity here to able to either host a company that's looking for installing a new facility for production or working with a company on a joint venture in solar energy or solar panels or electrical vehicles. And we're speaking about technologies that are able to move the Middle East countries into the value chain rather than just being consumers or much more on the lower part of the value chain. I think the region could be the next Southeast Asia because of location and the political well and also where the Gulf is in terms of their own economic, political and digital landscape. So I think there's an opportunity here. I think reform is key here. Mohamed, we're running short on time, but before we wrap up, where do you see things heading going forward and, and what are the key areas you'll be watching? My last remarks that the Middle East and North Africa are not a passive participant in this new technological landscape globally. They're not just consumers. There are active players. You see the Gulf states bringing companies from Asia and Europe to install shops in their own home countries. They're building their own human talent. You see Egypt and Morocco are trying to play a, a much more influential role in the value chain in industries like car manufacturing, or you see how uh, countries in North Africa are trying to optimize their position in Africa and as members of the Africa Trade Agreement. So they're not really passive participants. They're active participants. They're trying to find or redefine themselves to meet the challenges of the 21st century. So that's basically my main takeaway. In terms of what I'm going to keep an eye on, I will keep an eye on the industrial policy of the broader Middle East region. Will the Middle East region succeed in benefiting from this tech decoupling to bring manufacturing capabilities on a larger scale? Not speaking about one or two projects, but like larger scale industrial production capabilities in the region. And I think the region, because of geography, demography, connectivity, capital, is very well positioned to benefit from tech decoupling in the medium term. Mohamed, thank you again very much for joining us today. Appreciate your insights. Alistair, such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. That's all the time we have this week. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in and to our production team for all of their work on this week's episode. You can find our latest coverage of regional tech and cybersecurity issues on our website at www.mei.edu. You can follow MEI on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and subscribe to our email newsletters for the latest analysis and information about upcoming events. I'm Alistair Taylor. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.